I tend to start these videos by framing the situation that each state was in at the time the Constitution was proposed, but today my work is already done for me. I made a video that explained what Massachusetts was up to in the 1780s, but I'll give a quick recap. Western farmers sick of being in debt and saddled with pretty much all of the state's taxes rose up in rebellion. This was known as Shays Rebellion. It was put down without much fuss by Eastern forces, but the state was left in a precarious position. Rather than punish the rebels, Boston instead pursued a policy of forgiveness. Capitalizing on this, John Hancock swept the next gubernatorial elections by creating a coalition of the former Shazites and moderate Easterners. I'm going to add one last piece of relevant context. When it came to constitutions, the townsmen of Massachusetts considered themselves experts. When the wartime government sent a proposed state constitution to be rubber stamped by the towns, they were surprised to discover that the towns thoroughly rejected their proposal. Every voter in the state expected to have a say. So when the federal convention made its way to Massachusetts, many were inherently suspicious. They had just submitted the state constitution and the Articles of Confederation to towns for approval, why did this one deserve a convention? Federalists in the legislature convinced critics to hold a proper convention, but they had to agree that the convention would be absolutely massive. Every town could send as many delegates as they had seats in the legislature. Add to that the fact that the government would pay the delegates for the trouble of attending. There was no reason not to go. Opposition to the Constitution was spread all over the state. However, the problem areas were largely in Western Mass and Maine. Maine was chiefly made up of poorer citizens that had little in common with the coastal elite in Boston. Plus, they were inclined to think of the Constitution just as another obstacle from achieving eventual statehood. Let's take a quick rundown of who would be attending. Three signers of the Constitution would be there, but notably the fourth attendee, Elbridge Gerry, was defeated in the elections due to his opposition to the Constitution. Well, his opinion was more complicated than that. Gary liked the Constitution, he just also wanted a Bill of Rights. But these were the same thing according to his constituents, so they did not choose him as a delegate. John Adams would not be attending as he was serving as the ambassador to the United Kingdom. However, his cousin, Samuel Adams, would be. Sam Adams was an old-fashioned revolutionary, and he was incredibly paranoid about any minute threat to his Republican ideals. To him, the Constitution was a slap to the face. His comments made it to his constituents in Boston, some of whom met at the Green Dragon Tavern to send a not-so-veiled threat at him. They unanimously endorsed the Constitution and said that they expected that their representatives would support it as well. Adams took this seriously. The will of the people to him came above his personal feelings. The former governor, James Bowdoin, would also be attending, as a very strong Federalist, no less. He wouldn't say too much during the convention because most of Western Massachusetts absolutely hated him. And finally, the current governor, the massively popular John Hancock. The one story everyone knows about John Hancock is that he signed his name really large on the Declaration of Independence. This story paints him as the kind of guy who's very rash and decisive and consequences be damned, but this could not be further from the truth. Hancock was a slow, cautious, and pragmatic man, and one heck of a politician. Nobody in the country knew what he thought about the Constitution, and that was just how he liked it. When the winds of public opinion would begin to show themselves, that's when he would make his opinion known, that he was on the winning side the whole time. So when the convention began on January 9th, Hancock was not in attendance. Now, to be fair, Hancock did suffer from gout that more or less left him crippled, and he was also grieving his recently deceased son, so maybe we can cut him a little bit of slack here. Anyway, the convention elected him president in absentia, so the convention VP would preside. Apart from the bigwigs, a total of 364 delegates would attend the convention. Some towns had even sent more than they were technically allowed to, and added to that number, hundreds of citizens wanted to attend the convention in the gallery as observers. The Long Lane Meeting House offered to host the convention, where the galleries alone could fit up to 800 people. Between the delegates and observers, the church remained packed for the duration of the convention. The Federalists' plan was a subtle one. By King's count, they were short of a majority so they couldn't let the critics know that they were in control of the convention. They would have to slowly peel away votes during the debates. 
This came to a head before they even talked about the details of the Constitution. The opposition wanted to invite Elbridge Gerry as an observer so that they could ask him clarifying questions. Normally, Federalists would try to keep away anyone that had even thought of the word amendment in the past decade, but to avoid showing their hand, they supported the proposal. They dove into debating the Constitution, and it was a slog. It seemed like every single clause caused some kind of controversy. Term lengths were too long, there were no term limits, the size of the house was too small and could be capped, and there were no religious qualifications to stop infidels, Mohammedans, and papists from holding office. A major sticking point was in Article 1, Section 4, which left the elections of representatives up to the states. However, Congress had the authority to alter the logistics of these elections. This was alarming to a lot of people. The reason it was in the Constitution in the first place was to force places like Georgia or Rhode Island to actually elect federal representatives, because they often just didn't send anyone. But this wasn't comforting enough for critics. When discussing why the Senate would not have proportional representation, the delegates that had signed the Constitution tried to explain that this was a major debate during the Federal Convention, and it would be better to just leave it alone. A delegate suggested that Elbridge Gerry was on the committee that had agreed to unequal representation, so he must support the compromise too. Gerry requested to make an address, thinking that his opinion was being taken out of context. A Federalist named Francis Dana objected to this. Nobody had asked Gerry a question, so he was not permitted to address the convention. Gerry felt like he had to defend himself. If he couldn't give his perspective on the Federal Convention, then what was the point of him being there? This led to a full-blown shouting match between Gary, Dana, and their supporters. Eventually, Rufus King broke up the argument, and both men stormed out. Dana came back later, but Gary would not return. Thinking that they had seen enough, some critics decided that they were comfortable with just taking a vote and rejecting the Constitution then and there. This was bad news. Maybe they had convinced some people to vote for ratification, but it wasn't nearly enough. A vote now would end in rejection. Then, Sam Adams, who had been quiet for most of the convention, spoke up. He was not convinced that the Constitution was worth ratifying, but he hadn't yet made up his mind. He wanted to hear out the rest of the arguments in the document. With his support, the convention could continue. Adams had bought them some time, but King and Gorham were starting to face the fact that unless they could come up with some kind of plan, they would not be able to find the votes to ratify. The second half of the debates went faster, but there was still no shortage of criticisms. Habeas corpus could be suspended in times of rebellion, like it had been during Shays' Rebellion, and they were horrified at the protections on the slave trade. Although, as some people pointed out, it would actually be easier to end the slave trade under the Constitution than it would be under the Articles of Confederation. The structure of the executive and judicial branches were pretty agreeable to most people, but a couple of interesting points were made. Trial by jury was not guaranteed, and there was no protections against self-incrimination, cruel and unusual punishments, and no minimum amount of property to justify lawsuits across state borders. If you've taken a civics class in the United States, those might sound a little familiar to you. During the debates on Article 4, Maine's delegates pointed out that no new state could be formed from the boundaries of a current one, unless the government of that state approved it, basically barring Maine from separating until Massachusetts agreed. Rufus King, a Mainer himself, tried to assuage their fears by arguing for the Constitution from Maine's point of view. But beyond speeches, King, along with Nathaniel Gorham and a couple of other Federalists, were doing some backdoor scheming. John Hancock, who is still absent from the convention, received an interesting proposition from the Federalists. If he would attend the convention and support the Constitution, that might be able to push them over the edge. If that wasn't enough, Federalists did the unthinkable. They wanted Hancock to propose amendments. The fact that they were even considering this shows how desperate they were. In Pennsylvania, they had gone through extreme lengths to stop amendments from being proposed. Now, it was a necessity. But wait just a minute, said John Hancock. What's in it for John Hancock? Well, he'd be a state and national hero, even more than he already was. Plus, if Virginia didn't ratify, a certain Virginian war hero wouldn't be able to run for president. John Adams was in England, and Ben Franklin was way too old. Hancock could be the first president of the United States. But even that wasn't enough. He made his rival, James Bowdoin, promise that he would not run against him in the next gubernatorial elections. Now they had a deal. On January 30th, Governor Hancock entered the Long Lane Meeting House. 
he was being carried in on a litter, as his gout was making it difficult to move. The whole church was full of energy that he was attending. After the next morning's debates, he told the convention that he had a plan that would leave both sides happy. He'd tell them that afternoon. The convention adjourned for the morning, but the gallery was abuzz. Hundreds remained in the church, so that they didn't lose their front row seats to whatever Hancock had planned. That afternoon, Hancock rose with difficulty and gave his proposal. Massachusetts should ratify the Constitution on the condition that these amendments would be submitted and adopted by the new government after it was created. Now, these amendments were shockingly similar to the concerns that delegates had with the Constitution. How could Hancock have known? Well, Federalists had written the amendments for him, specifically so that they would convince as many delegates as possible to switch sides. Hopefully it was enough. Even Sam Adams seconded the motion, which was a good sign. The delegates put forward the question of ratification. The clerk read out the names of every single one of the 355 delegates in attendance. The packed church was completely silent. Massachusetts ratified the Constitution by a vote of 187 to 168. By just 19 votes, Massachusetts became the sixth state to ratify the Constitution. Predictably, most of the no votes were in Shays country, but Maine was more evenly split than expected. Maybe this was the amendments, or maybe King had convinced a couple of his fellow Mainers. Importantly, this was a conditional ratification. By proposing amendments, Federalists had opened up Pandora's box. Now, if the Constitution was ratified, they would also probably need to contend with an untold number of amendments from the upcoming conventions. Would the Federalists' fears come true? But for now, they could celebrate their second major victory. New Hampshire was up next. <laughs>